Today's topic, the title of today's sermon is Can God Go Wrong? Can God Go Wrong? We're going to talk about His will and our free will. So, can God go wrong? Can God make a mistake? Can God say something wrong? Probably not. We're going to see that. Are you sure about it? If God says something wrong, that becomes right. That's what you always taught, right? Whatever God says is right. If God says this is blue is black, black will become blue, right? So, but the concept is can God go wrong? Is there a record anywhere that God said something and it went wrong? And that brings us to the question of whether our free will, if God knows everything and if God pre-planned everything and God knows everything in advance, then do we have a free will? If God knew that we would do certain things at a certain particular time, does that mean we used our free will or we were all planned to do that? It's something which people always are confused in the mind. If God knows everything and if God has pre-planned everything, then where is the free will? Where is our free will? Aren't we doing what God already pre-planned? So is there a free will in our life? So we think that it's a conflict what is happening. And some people believe that if something goes wrong in our lives, we think God wanted that to happen. God planned that to happen. Am I right? If you met with an accident or you failed in an exam, you might think, maybe God really wanted me to fail in the exam. Or God wanted me to lose a job. Or God gave me the sickness. That's why I'm having it. So if God had knows everything and pre-planned everything, isn't everything happening according to his plan? Isn't everything happening according to the way he wants it? So if that's the case, where is our free will? Where is our choice? So in this concluding part of 1 Corinthians 16, last week we saw about the great contribution that Paul made. And we saw how from Macedonia, how the gifts from Macedonia, Macedonia reached the shores of Kerala and how the collection was so important to sustain the church in Jerusalem through the famine that they went through. And Paul now talks about in verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7, says like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7, says like this. For I do not want to see you now, just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. Now, we all love the statement, if the Lord permits, right? We all use that statement, if the Lord permits. So Paul here is saying, I don't want to see you in passing because what Paul is trying to say is, if I'm going to come to you now, it will be on my way to Jerusalem. That's what, if it is. So I don't want to do that now, but I want to come and spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. And we often use this for a lot of our activities in our life. If the Lord permits, we will do this, we will do that. So what does Paul mean when he says, if the Lord permits? Before that, couple of things you can understand from the scriptures. Two things you can understand from this portion of scripture. One is Paul is a great planner. Paul is a great planner. He planned out things. He said I don't, he's saying I don't want to come to you now because if I'm coming now I'm going to go in passing. Which means he had a plan of passing and going somewhere. On the way he can drop in to the Corinthian church but he says I don't want to do that now I'll come later and I want to spend some time with you probably weeks and months with you so I can share so Paul planned out all his mission trip planned a lot of things in his mind with his people and he, I'm sure he prayed about it and he asked God to and he planned a lot of things so that is the first thing we see that Paul was a great planner he planned out a lot of things going here going there we'll see a few more verses on that and the second thing we see that Paul recognized that Jesus is his Lord. In everything that he does, Jesus is the Lord. Paul submits himself to the leadership of God, of Jesus. That's what we see from this verse. Two very important things that you can see here. One, Paul is a planner. He planned out a lot of things. Number two, Paul submitted to the leadership of Jesus. And it says... If the Lord permits, I will come there. So the question I want to ask is, will God not permit a good cause? Now Paul is planning all these things. And then he says, if the Lord permits. Does that mean that there is a time where God will say, no, don't go there? Does that mean that God will not permit something good that you planned with prayer? 
Of course, you planned with prayer, isn't it? Does that mean that God will not permit a good cause? These are things that run in our mind. That these are things sometimes we are confused about. Whether really God is my free will. Where is my free will in this? Where is my decision in this? Some people think that, you know, everything happens based on God's information and he or orchestrated everything that happens, which means I can just sit back and relax. God will do whatever he wants and I will relax whatever I want. God didn't tell me to do this, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to relax. Some people have that concept in mind. Let God do what he wants. He will make me do what he wants. So I'm not from my side going to do anything. He will make me do it. That's some concept what pe some people have. But remember, Paul planned out a lot of things. All through the scriptures, if you can monitor Paul's life, the greatest guy who wrote the scriptures, in the, which is recorded as we have what is called as the Bible, he planned out a lot of things, a lot of trips, a lot of journey. In fact, his ultimate aim, Paul's ultimate aim was to go to the ends of the earth, which was at that time, the end of the earth was Spain. So Paul's aim, his plan, was that on his third mission journey, he will reach Spain. We are not sure if he reached Spain. We, haven't, we don't have that recorded in the scriptures. Some people say he did, but we are not sure. But his aim and his plan was to reach Spain. So he did everything. He planned everything so that he can do God's work wherever he went. And, and this planning concept is something which God has given man. Animals can't plan ahead of time. Animals can't do it. We as human beings, because we are created in the image of God, we have a concept or an ability to plan things. Trees can't plan. Dogs can't plan. Elephants can't plan. There are certain kind of animals and birds who migrate. They go and come back. They are pre-wired to go and come back. They don't plan it out. They just go and they just come back. But man, as a human being, because we are created in the image of God, we have this ability of planning. And that is God's ability of planning too. Now, why did Paul say if God uh, permits? One of the reasons is because at one point of time, Paul was stopped in doing. Like, turn to Acts 16, verses 6 to 10. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 10. It says like this. And they went through the region of uh, Phygria, Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Look at this. Now the Holy Spirit forbid him to speak God's word in Asia. Verse 7. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here we see God in his sovereign will is moving Paul. Paul planned out everything, but still at one particular time, God, and we see the Trinity here also, where God is changing the plan which Paul had made. Now, we don't know why it happened, but I'm sure if you read the rest of the scriptures, we saw the Macedonian call and we saw about how God meets Lydia and gets her to Christ and we saw, we see about a lot of things happening. So probably God did want him to go at that time or, or at that place. I'm sure of that. And maybe he didn't know about it, but God orchestrated that. So is it because of that, Paul says, if God permits, I will come here, I will come there. Is that what Paul is talking about? Anyway, the fact is that the Holy Spirit forbid him to speak to that. You know, have you been in some situation where you see a friend, you know, and you're about to say something, it's in your mind you want to say something and then you stop uh, okay, never mind. Change the topic. Have you done that? Maybe it's something bad or some filth you want to say. You're just going to, you're just going to blurt out the thing and you it come at the tip of the mouth, tongue and then you stop, you bite your tongue mm. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't say that. Okay, never mind. Change the topic. And then the other person like, what did you want to say? I know. You wanted to say something bad, right? You want to say something bad of me. Is that what the Holy Spirit sometimes stops you from speaking? And I'm sure it is. Many times in our lives too, the Holy Spirit 
does prompt us to speak certain things, and sometimes Holy Spirit prompts us not to speak certain things. And this is what happened here. Holy Spirit didn't allow Paul to speak in that. And then we see that the, uh, the Spirit of Jesus appeared and told Paul not to go here. Some theologians say this is Spirit of Jesus and Holy Spirit is the same. It could be the different also. It could be the Damascus Road experience where Paul directly uh, meets Jesus or sees Jesus. Of course, he's blind at that time and he hears Jesus' voice. Could it be that Jesus was present at this time here too, telling him to go to so-and-so place because for Lydia or for Macedonia? Could be that too. Anyway, we know that God changed that plan of Paul at that time and got him to another place. So the word permit, if God permits, if God permit, the permit means to allow someone to do something or the consent, to consent with somebody. The permission that Jesus gives to go or to give, that's the word used here. Another very common word related to this, if God permits, is the very common one, which I'm sure all of, if you haven't used if God permits, you've used this one, that is God willing. Have you used that? Okay. Pastor, I will see you in the evening. Yeah, God willing, I'll see you in the evening. Have you used that word? God willing, I'll see you. The Latin word for that is Dio volente. Dio volente. The Latin word for it. The Arabic word for it is Inshallah. <laughs> and I know all of you have heard this being used. And you used it also. Probably most of you have used it. Right? That is the word God willing. If God permits and God willing. Very closely related. But there is a slight difference in that too. But this, can I tell you something? This will be strange if I tell you. This word, God willing, was not biblical. This word, God willing, didn't start in the Bible. This word, God willing, Dio Volente, started in B.C. And you can find it in the writings of Plato, in the Greek religious text. You can find this word, Dio Volente, being used in many of the old Greek Roman writings. So it is not, it didn't start with the biblical times. God willing was there even before the biblical times. Yes, the biblical readers, the apostles, did use this word. Now, they used it slightly different. This is called a Jacobian condition, what they call this, Dio Volente, Jacobian condition, God willing. That's what they call it, the Greeks used to call it at, at, at that time. It's a common phrase used. But now, James, one of the apostles, takes this and slightly fine-tunes it for the Christian culture. If you go to James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, it says like this, James chapter 4, 13 to 15, it says this, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, look at this, instead, what do you say? Instead, you have to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Now look at this. James is talking to some business people. Some business guys came and said, I'm going to take the ship. Okay, let's put it in modern time. I'm going to take Emirates flight today and go to Nairobi or wherever, you know, Uganda or wherever. Then I'm going to do business there. Then take the next flight and go to UK. I'm going to do business there. Stay there for a few days. Do this, do that, and then come back. So there were these business people talking to James. And James is saying, you are talking all this fine. But the fact that is that you cannot do all this if God doesn't give you life. If God gives you life, you can do that. Verse 15, so the, 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 the phrase here is to wish, to express a person's desire. If God, if God wills a, a wish. So the will and the wish here, if God does it. If the, and Paul, uh, sorry, James says, before, what you saw is God willing, right? James turns it and says, Lord willing. If you look at James 4.15, it says, James 4.15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So who is the Lord? So James is changing the God, which the Romans and the Greeks use, and replaced by Lord. 
And who is the Lord? In James 2, 1, it says, My brothers, show no partiality on, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So who is the Lord here that James is referring to? It is our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you go back to verse 14, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do that. So what is the meaning of what James is trying to explain here? What James is trying to say is, the world used to say, God willing, God willing, God willing, inshallah, inshallah. But James is telling here, you have to say, if the Lord wills, if we have, if we, we will live and do this. In fact, in short, I can say, let me paraphrase it. If the Lord gives us life, we will do this, we will do that. So what Paul is trying to say is, if God permits to come to see the Corinthian church, when he says that, he could be meaning what James explained. That is, if God gives me life, I will come and spend time with you. It is not basically talking about, yes, God did change Paul's plan here and there, but it's not in, as a thumb rule that God will change all the plans. No. Basically, the whole concept here is, if God gives you life, we will do this. Which means, every time you use the word, God willing, or if the Lord's permit, you're actually saying that, as long as I have life, I will do that. That's what he's saying. But unfortunately, today in our culture today, <laughs> Johnny, do your homework? Inshallah, I'll do my homework. Which means what? If God, if God allows me, if God's willing, I will do my homework. And then when he fails and comes, I will be, have the stick in my hand and says, Inshallah, I will beat you also. Right? If God willing, I will beat you also. Right? So that's what we tend to think that this God willing and this, uh, all these phrases that we have, we try to say it like, you know, whatever happens is God happens. That's what. But that is not the biblical way of looking at things. The biblical way is a commitment, if you're using the word, which means as long as I have life, I will come there. As long as I have life, I will do this. I'm committed. So it's a very strong statement that James explaining here and telling the church that as long as I have life, you will do this, you will do that. It's a commitment. It's not a phrase that you should be casually saying it. Ah, if it happens, it happens. Right? So that is what Paul is talking about. If the Lord wills, if the Lord permits. So our statement here is not of a, of a statement that you can casually take, but it's a strong, of strong statement. All right? Now, when we're talking about the free will and all that, do God knows everything, right? We all know that God knows everything. God knows everything. But has, as I told you, has God made a mistake as I asked you in the beginning? Do you think God can make a mistake? And all of you said no, right? Let's look at two scriptures from the Bible, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament of certain things where God changed, all right? 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2 to 4. 1 Samuel 23, 2 to 4. Now, this is a situation where David is got a report from some people uh, in Kela saying that the Philistines has come to rob their uh, the harvest. So uh, David gets an army together and wants to go to defend those people of God against the Philistines who are coming to steal. So he asked God in verse Verse 2, it says like this, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go attack the Philistines and save Kela. No dispute over here. God said to go, and they're going. But verse 3, But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Kela against the armies of Philistine? So then verse 4, it says, Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Kela, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So this we see where David wants to know from God, should we go or not? This is what, Lord, what is your will? Should I go or not? We often ask this question. God, can I go or not? So God says, go. The people are afraid. So God, David again asks the Lord and God confirms to him, go. And then David goes, 
saves the city of Kela from the Philistines, loots the enemy's uh, spoil, and is victorious. When Saul comes to know about this, when Saul hears about this, Saul gets an idea. Oh, this is a great idea, Saul thinks. Saul said, let me trap David in this city of Kela so that I can kill and eradicate David once and for all. Now, David came to know about this plan. We don't know how, but David came to know about this plan of Saul coming to attack David in the city. So, now David got worried and he asked the Lord again. In verse 10, same chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 10. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Kela to destroy the city on my account. Verse 11. Will the men of Kela surrender me into this, his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. So, when David is asking, will they get trapped? Will Kela uh, or what is it? Give up, give him up to Saul, and God said, "Yes, he will come down." All right? Then verse twelve. Then David said, "Will the men of Kela surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul?" And the Lord said, "They will surrender." So God says here two things. One is, Saul will come to them and trap them, and number two, for the city to escape, will the city, my people of Kela take David and surrender him to Saul? Yes, God said they will. Then what happens? Now look at this verse 13. It's very important. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Kela, and they went wherever they could go. When, when Saul was told that David had escaped from Kela, he gave up his expedition. Look at this now. Did God say that Saul will come? In the previous verse? Yes. God said, Saul will come. But here in this verse, what happens? Saul doesn't come. Did God say that people of Kela will hand over David to Saul? God said, yes. But did that happen? No, it didn't happen. So did God make a mistake? <laughs> Very smart. One, one person said, God made a mistake. <laughs> uh, you might think God be, did make a mistake. God didn't make a mistake. See, the foreknowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it will happen. The foreknowledge means God knows everything. God knows this way or that way. As one of the scholars, Michael Heiser, said, this foreknowledge of God is like the chess game. Like playing a chess game. Ultimately, God is going to win. But which route and which path you take, whether you kill the pawn or the elephant or the bishop, that is left to the player. The ultimate destiny, it is predestined. But the route you take, God knows all the routes. God knows all the ways. So it is not that God didn't make a mistake, but God said what would happen if you stayed back or if you did this or that. But it is left to us now to decide what you're going to do based on that information God has told you. You can either stay back and face Saul, or you can leave like what he did and escape Saul. The choice is yours. That is a free will, the choice God gave. But the foreknowledge of God doesn't mean predestination. Now look, this is in the Old Testament. Let's come to the New Testament to see what happens. New Testament, Acts chapter 21, verse 14. Acts 21, verse 4. Sorry, verse 4. Acts chapter 21, verse 4. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. This is now Paul going to Jerusalem before he's going to be arrested. So people in the city, uh, before coming in here, prophesied or told Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Now this is prophecy by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is telling Paul, don't go. And people are telling to Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Okay? Acts 21 verse 8 to 14. Acts 21, same chapter, verses 8 to 14. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. Now, this is another place. Now, Paul, prof Paul heard the prophecy not to go to Jerusalem in the previous town. Now, it's the next town, Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. 
So ladies, you can prophesy too. Whether you're married, not married, you can still prophesy too. Okay, it's biblical. Verse 10. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Verse 11. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his, this belt and deliver him into the hands of Gentiles. Now this is a strong prophecy. This is not the first time. The second time the prophecy is coming to Paul saying, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem because you're going to land up in trouble. This is a pro- now if you get a prophecy like this, what are you going to do? Scoot, right? Go away. And that's what David did. When David came to know that Saul is coming, he ran, he left. But here Paul, he's being prophesied a second time. Prophecy is coming to you through the Holy Spirit. And it's written in the Bible that it's through the Holy Spirit. Thus says Thus says the Holy Spirit, so it should be the Holy Spirit, not anybody speaking, that this is going to happen. So a strong sec- prophecy a second time to Paul. And then look at this, verse 12. When we heard this, we and the, pos- and the people were urged, sorry, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Verse 13. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Look at this. Prophecy coming to Paul. Strong prophecy coming to Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But what does Paul do? Paul goes against what the Holy Spirit told him and goes to Jerusalem because he said, I am willing to die for God. So when this foreknowledge of God, whether it comes through any way, through prophecy or any way, any other way, you have a free will to choose whether which direction you want to go based on the foreknowledge. Now let me go. Would Dave, if David stayed in that city of Kaila and got arrested by Saul, do you think David would not have become the king? They, God, God has many ways of working. They, God can change things around for the good. And he can still become the king, irrespective of which way David took. In the same way, if Paul didn't go to Jerusalem at this time and stayed back and went to the rest, went the other direction, back to Rome, do you think that the Gentiles would not be saved? Do you think these books would not be written? Absolutely not. This thing can still happen too. So the way you take is not what God is destining us. Our end predestination is what God has set for us. He has predestined for us. It's good. It is awesome. It is beautiful. But the way you're going to go, it's your choice. It's your will. So Paul, Paul, irrespective of the prophecy from the Holy Spirit, goes against that into Jerusalem. And he said, I am willing to die. So his aim, Paul's aim at that time, Paul wanted to do is go to Jerusalem meet the apostles there and then from there go to Rome. So he wanted to do that and he stuck to the plan. So God is, God is not limited to your decisions. God can make anything happen in our lives but he gives you the free will to choose which way to go this way or that way. You can ask God whatever you want and God will tell you because God has a foreknowledge and you can decide which way to go this way or that way. But that choice is yours. But ultimately, God can get you where you want. So, the will of God. What is the will of God in our lives? What is the will of God in our lives? When Jesus was asked this question, he said like this, in Matthew 21, verse 28 to 32. Matthew 21, 28 to 32. What is God's will? What do you think, Jesus said? And he says a parable. A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he, answer, and he answered, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I will go. But he didn't go. Verse 31. Which of the two did the will of the father? Very easy question, right? Not a brainer. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. And he explains, for John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him and even when 
you saw it, you did not afterward change your mind and believe him. So what is the will of God? Will of God is doing what believing in God, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is the will of God. Jesus also prayed, God, let your will be done. Matthew 26, 42 says, again for the second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So here we see, Jesus knows the will of the Father. He knows, if when you know the will of the Father, you can boldly say, this is the will of the Father, or this is God's will. I am going to stand for it, by it. And look, look at some more verses about will of the Father. What does God will? Wants. Ephesians 1, 4 to 11 says like this, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He's already chosen us, okay, before the foundation of the world. He predestined us for adoption. So he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To, and why? To praise his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And it goes on to say about many things Paul talks about here to the, um, to the Ephesians church about, you know, uh, don't get drunk, uh, walk righteously, you know, make the excuse of your time. These are all ways you can do the will of the Father, will of God, Paul says here. But the most important, what Paul, important thing is here is God has already predestined us, like the chess game. The end is predestined. What is that? Jesus Christ is going to be victorious. That's the end. And he has predestined us so that we are all adopted into his family. We are all in Jesus Christ, a part of him. That is what he's predestined us. But this will and predestination when we talk about is nothing to do with which shirt I'm going to wear today. Or God wanted me to meet with an accident today. It has nothing to do with that. Some of it is your own mistake. Most of it. You meet with an accident, it's not your own mistake. Not that God loved it to happen. So let us be clear on what is God's will. Psalms 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O God, your law is within my heart. What is God's will? That his law is in our hearts. And what is the greatest law that we have given today? One time Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment to follow? And Jesus said, Matthew 22, 36 to, 38, 36 to 40 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the f great and first commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends the, all the law and the prophets. So everything is concluded in two things. What are the two words? Number one is what? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. And number two is love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two things God said to do. If the will of God is to have his laws, commandments in our heart, then let me tell you, the will of God is just two things. One is what? Love God, love people. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, I love you? Love God and love people. Yeah. If somebody else's wife is sitting next to, please don't say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> love God. That is God's will. You've been asking, what is Lord? What is your will in my life, Lord? Very plain and simple. Love God, love people. If you do these two things, everything will be in place. Everything is in place. That is God's will. You can ask God which shirt to wear today morning. You can ask. No hassle on that. But that's your choice finally, which one you're going to wear. Which car you want to buy. You can ask God, yes, he can tell you. But it doesn't mean that you have to do it. Or if you, if you don't do it and do something else, it doesn't mean God is going to hate you. No, it's your choice. It's your free will. The way you go is your choice. But your destination, predestination, is already confirmed. 
many many scriptures first Thessalonians 4:3 for this is the will of god your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality keeping away from sexual immorality is the will of god first Thessalonians 5:18 give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of Christ, will of god in christ jesus give thanks in all situations all these verses many verses but again all this is centralized on two things love god love people if you have this two in place then all this will come in place ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 to 10 beautiful scripture about uh, may, being like god therefore be imitators of god as beloved children and walk in love as christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to god but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints let there be no filthiness no foolish talk no crude joking which are out of place but instead let there be thanksgiving i think if you should we should erase this verse from the bible uh, it's quite difficult no filthiness no foolish talk no no crude joking that should not come out of your mouth but instead let it be thanksgiving verse 5 for you may be sure of this that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of god kingdom of christ and god let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of god comes upon the sons of disobedience therefore do not become partners with them for at one time you were uh, for at one time you were darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of the light for the light for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the lord as you walk in christ what paul is telling here is try to discern as you love god and love people as you walk in the spirit try to discern what is god's will what is the what does what is pleasing to the lord what is what which are the things god permits which god doesn't permit it's a lifelong process it's a lifelong process <clears throat> now you know that god has god see look at this one verse first timothy 2 3 and 4 it is this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of god our savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth this is what god desires god desires everyone to be saved but can i ask you will everyone be saved everyone will not be saved this is god's desire that everyone should be saved but the fact is that everyone will not be saved there will be people left out at the rapture they will not be saved if you don't believe if they don't believe they will not be saved so there are many things god desires but we our people itself because of our choices because of our decisions we have gone wrong too even adam and eve god's desire was not to eat of the fruit but he ate and sin came so the for knowledge of god doesn't mean predestination in every situation for knowledge of god gives you information how you can go about doing things but our destiny finally we are all destined by god it's our it's our choice andrew womack says about finding god's will the beautiful teaching he has and i think you all should listen to it finding god's will he talks about it in many topics but one thing that he mentioned and it's very good here romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 romans 12 1 and 2 to know god's will i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind by the testing uh, that by testing you may discern what is the will of god which is good and acceptable and perfect so how do you know the will of god the will of god to know is in verse 1 which is present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god do not be conformed to this world but be transformed to this world. transformed the key is here to know the will of god is not about doing things the to know the will of god is about being what he said to be that is the will of god the will of god is not about doing this 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 that yes you have to do this this you have to plan you do that but the key in the will of god is being what god called you to be that is being a living sacrifice being not 
conform to this world but be transformed it is not about doing but it is about being it is not about doing but it is about being and that is the will of god being god's child being imitators of christ being christ in every situation being adopted into the family so that wherever you are you are part of christ where you are placed that is god's will in our life the way you go about doing it the way you go about executing it is your free will it's left up to you but as long as you are not conformed to this world but you're transformed by the renewing of mind as long as you are that as long as you are a living sacrifice for somebody as christ was as long as you are being like christ imitators of christ walking in the spirit as long as you're doing that as long as all this being is you are in god's will remember one thing you are all human what you are all human beings not human doings that is important you are all human beings not human doings so the whole idea the concept is not about you doing things for god the will of god but the whole concept of god's permit of god's will god's willing is being what god wants you to be wherever you choose to be you can choose to go to canada you can choose to go back to india you can choose to stay here your choice god is not going to interfere that but wherever you are be what god wants you to be amen that is what is god's predestination because our end is predestined let's do great things for god yeah in that being let's attempt great things for god let's do great things for god shall we close our eyes in prayer thank you lord jesus thank you lord you never made a mistake when you said certain things you never went wrong but you knew everything lord you know everything in our lives thank you lord jesus thank you father thank you holy spirit for speaking to us and in our day to day lives lord let us learn to be more like you lord let us learn to be whatever you called us to be lord in our workplaces in our family reunions when we go to the shop when we meet others on the street wherever we are at any time any point of time lord we want to be what you called us to be and that is your will and lord we want to understand that more closely lord and lord lord as long as you have given us life lord we want to do great things for you lord being in christ thank you jesus thank you for your scriptures thank you for teaching us the scriptures lord thank you master for blessing us we love you lord and teach us more in the weeks to come in the days to come lord teach us more of your scriptures lord that we can we can be according to your will your desire your plan thank you lord thank you once again for this time in jesus name we pray and everybody said amen i call pastor for the benediction let us stand up on our feet let's receive the benediction may the love of the father and the grace of our lord jesus christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all now and forever and church say amen god bless you all